welcome to this talk. Uh, I am Eleni Onel from Stanford University, and I will serve as the moderator for this talk. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in Discord, and Kai will answer them afterwards. After the talk, we will not take um, questions um, from the audience, um, except if time permits at the end. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this, after, this afternoon, Kai Chalibak from Augsburg University, <coughs> Germany. And um, his title is, um, just one second. Um, sorry. Um, his title is Lagrange Multiplier Functionals and their Applications in Symplectic Geometry and String Topology. Kai? Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, it's a great honor to be able to speak here. Um, I want to uh, tell a little story of how some, some old uh, idea from calculus of variations has found its way into symplectic geometry and has led to some new results in symplectic geometry. And then more recently, how this has spilled over into the theory of loop spaces and into string topology. Uh, the talk will have three parts. Uh, the first part will explain this old idea from calculus, namely Lagrange multiplier functionals. In the second one, I'll, I'll focus on a very specific Lagrange multiplier functional, the, the Rabinowitz actional functional, and uh, explain its implications in symplectic geometry. And then in the third part, I'll come to a version of Poincaré duality for loop spaces. Uh, all this is joint work with Urs Frauenfelder, Alexandru Wanscher, and Nancy Hingston in varying configurations, as you'll see as we go along. All right, so, so what are Lagrange multiplier functionals? The idea goes back to Lagrange in 1804, uh, and he was uh, looking at a variational problem, finding um, an extremum or a critical point of a function f subject to a constraint given by another function h being equal to zero. And uh, then you can uh, reformulate that problem by introducing a new function, which I called capital F, depending on additional, an additional variable, which I termed lambda, this is the Lagrange multiplier, and uh, f of x lambda is f of x minus lambda times h of x. And now you look, at, you look for critical points of capital F, this is a little proof that is actually written here on the slide, you, uh, you take derivative with respect to x, you find the equation that df of x is equal to lambda times dh of x, and you take derivative with respect to lambda, you find the equation h of x equal to zero. So a, a pair x comma lambda being a critical point of capital F means that first of all, x lies on the level set where h is equal to zero, and second, the, well, the, the differential of uh, f is a multiple of the differential of h, which precisely means that uh, x is a critical point of f restricted to the constraint h inverse of zero. Here, I'm implicitly assuming that zero is a regular value of h, right? And now, now this uh, can be done where both are functions from Rn to R, but you can also do it in more general settings uh, where the domain x could be a, a manifold itself or a Banach manifold and uh, the target of the Lagrange, uh, sorry, of, of the constraint h should be a vector space where it could be a RK, could be a Banach space itself. And in that case, the Lagrange multiplier would naturally live in the topological dual of V. All right. Now, what, here's one example, which many of you will have seen. Uh, suppose we start uh, with a complex Hilbert space x and a is a bounded uh, self-adjoint operator. And uh, as a function f, we take the quadratic form associated to a, and the function h is just x norm square minus one. So the constraint h, h equal to zero just means that the norm of x is equal to one. Now, if for, for this pair of f and h, you, you write down the condition of being a critical point of this function associated function capital F, then you find exactly the eigenvalue equation. So the critical point equation precisely means that a times x is equal to lambda times x. So you see in this example, this variable lambda, which we introduced as an, as an artificial new variable, actually acqu uh, acquires meaning. Yeah? So, so it really has a good mathematical meaning. It is uh, precisely an eigenvalue of the, uh, of the linear operator a. And uh, if you have some compactness, if a is compact, for instance, if the... Uh, if the space X is finite dimensional, 
then the unit sphere, which is the level set of H, uh, is, uh, is compact, say, and then uh, this uh, function F attains uh, its maximum minimum on that. So it does have critical points, which means that, uh, that such an operator has an eigenvalue. Yeah, so here's a nice analytical proof of the fact that every symmetric matrix has, a, has a, an eigenvalue. All right. Now uh, let's go one step further. Once we have a critical point, next thing we want to do is we want to look at the second derivative. We want to look at the Hessian. So how are the Hessians of little f and capital F related? And uh, this is something you could pose as an exercise to your, in your calculus class. Um, so the Hessian of capital F is the Hessian of little f and then two of diagonal terms coming from the differential of the constraint function little h. Uh, from that form of the matrix, you see that that matrix has the same, the Hessian of capital F has the same signature as the Hessian of F restricted to the constraint. In particular, so, so it has more, it is higher dimensional, so it has more eigenvalues, but they come in pairs, in positive negative pairs. In particular, the Hessian of capital F is never positive or negative definite. Now we want to use this Lagrange multiplier functional capital F in order to find critical points of little f subject to the constraint, because this has, the index, oh sorry, because the, uh, the Hessian is never definite, the direct methods in calculus of variations will not work, which are designed to find uh, maxima or minima under some convexity assumption. So we need to resort to some indirect methods. And our favorite indirect method to find critical points of a function is Morse theory, which uh, goes back to the 30s. And so, so here's the setup. Let me start in the simplest setup. M is a closed finite dimensional manifold. And we take phi a Morse function, meaning all its critical points are non-degenerate. And then we build a chain complex out of that. So the chain complex as, a, as, a, uh, as, as an abelian group is just the free abelian group whose uh, basis are the critical points of index k. And then I call this mck of phi. And then we define a boundary operator on that, which is a linear operator. So I just need to say what it's doing on generators and delta on a critical point P is counting, is a, is a sum over other critical points Q of index one less with coefficients. And the coefficient in each case is the count of gradient trajectories from P to Q. If the index difference is one, then generically there's only finitely many such gradient trajectories and you count them. You actually count them with signs. So there's also some signs hidden in that formula. And then you, you can prove that uh, this operator squares to zero. So it's actually a boundary operator. Uh, and if you haven't seen the proof, I uh, invite you to contemplate the picture drawn above that formula on the left. Uh, that is the proof in a nutshell. And uh, now you have a boundary operator, you can take its homology. Namely, you take the kernel modulo the image of delta and that is what we call the Morse homology in degree K. All right. Now let's go back to our previous situation. We have this function little f and the constraint and we have the Lagrange multiplier functional capital F. We've already seen that those two have the same critical points. Uh, and therefore the natural expectation would be that maybe their, two, their Morse homologies would also be isomorphic. Now it's, this is not entirely obvious because when you look at the gradient trajectories, they look very different. Those of the gradient trajectories of little f under restricted to the constraint, they remain on the constrained hypersurface. Whereas for capital F, they have no reason to remain on the constraint. Plus you have this additional Lagrange multiplier, which is also moving. Yeah, so, so it's not so, it's not obvious at all, even in finite dimensions that those have the same homology. In finite dimensions, this is true, but we'll be interested in infinite dimensional situations and there it's uh, not so clear at all. And uh, yeah, one possible problem is that the space on which the capital F is defined, the Lagrange multiplier functional, is never compact because at the very least, we have some vector space where the Lagrange multiplier lives, which is non-compact. I mean, this may look harmless, but we'll see that this is actually a, a serious non-compactness, which can be in your way in order to have this well-defined. All right, any questions at this point. Good. Then uh, I'll continue. Um, so now comes a bit of symplectic geometry. So 
uh, I'll go to a symplectic setup. And the symplectic setup is an exact symplectic manifold. There's a typo on the slide. Uh, it should be W comma mu because lambda I wanted to reserve for the Lagrange multiplier. So, so it's a manifold equipped with the one form, which I call mu, such that d mu is symplectic. So it's an exact symplectic manifold, and we impose some convexity condition at infinity if the manifold is non-compact, uh, which I will go, not go into, and then we call this a Liouville manifold. Uh, the main thing we need in this talk is the following two examples. One example is just Cn, linear space, with the one form which I wrote. And the other one is a cotangent bundle of any manifold M, also with a canonical one form, which I wrote. And uh, you can check both of those are symplectic forms. And uh, the convexity at infinity is satisfied in those two examples. All right, once we have a symplectic manifold, uh, we can define Hamiltonian systems, namely give a, so to, to every smooth function, which we call capital H, on that manifold, we can naturally associate a vector field by, by the implicit equation which that the differential of the function dh should be equal to what you get when you plug a vector field into the symplectic form this is similar to defining the gradient of a function when you have a when you have a scalar product but here we have a skew symmetric uh, two form um, but still it's non-degenerate so this uniquely defines a vector field xh once we have a vector field on our manifold we can look at the corresponding ode uh, x dot equals xa of x xh of x and we solve that so we get some Hamiltonian flow. And then what we are interested in, in symplectic geometry, we're not the only thing, but one thing we're particularly interested in is periodic orbits of this uh, Hamiltonian vector field. How do we find periodic orbits? How do we prove existence of periodic orbits? Now, if we want to, if we want to find periodic orbits of given periods, say of period one, we can do it as follows. We go, we define the loop space of maps from the circle into W of smooth maps, where I write the circle as R mod Z. So, so those are maps of period one into the manifold. So I build the period one into the setup. And on that loop space, you can write down a, a functional that goes back to Lagrange. Uh, uh, and this is a Hamiltonian action functional. Uh, H of X is equal to the integral of mu over the loop minus the average of the Hamiltonian over the loop. And you can work out that critical points of that functional are precisely solutions of the Hamiltonian system. And they're one periodic because that's built into the setup from the outset. Okay, now the way I set it up, my Hamiltonian is not explicitly depending on time. I could let it depend on time explicitly. I'm not doing that. If it doesn't explicitly depend on time, we have conservation of energy, meaning that the, Hamilt the value of the Hamiltonian is constant along uh, a Hamiltonian orbit. It's just a classical fact from mechanics. And uh, that means instead of periodic orbits of a fixed period, we might also be interested in periodic orbits of a fixed given energy. And that's how a Lagrange multiplier will come in because now we're asking for critical points subject to some constraint, namely that they have a particular energy. Therefore, we introduce the following function, which was first used by Rabinowitz in 1978 to prove existence of periodic orbits of given energy. So we modify the, Hamil the Hamiltonian action by introducing a new variable lambda, which in this case is just a real number as a Lagrange multiplier. And then we put that number in front of the integral over the Hamiltonian. So that's the only difference. It's like the Hamiltonian action, but we have this lambda in front of the integral where lambda is now an additional variable, the Lagrange multiplier. Now you work out the critical point equation for this functional. If you take derivative with respect to x, you see that x dot is lambda x h of x. So, so up to multiplication by a constant, it's still a Hamiltonian orbit. And the second equation variation with respect to lambda tells you that the average of h along that orbit is equal to zero. But now the miracle happens. Namely, the first equation tells you we still have conservation of energy. So the value of h along the orbit x of t is constant. And therefore, this, this average zero condition tells you that actually it's zero everywhere because it's constant. So, so uh, we get the fact that the orbit x of t for all times t lies on the level set sigma where, where h has value zero. Yeah. So. Um, so although we only impose the constraint on the average, by conservation of energy, it implies a pointwise constraint. 
So, so what we find is actually a Hamiltonian orbit of given energy zero. I normalize the energy to zero that I'm looking for. Yes. So this, uh, this is a marvelous thing. So we don't need an infinite dimensional Lagrange multiplier subject to this pointwise constraint, but only a real number. All right. But now something else happens, which, which is rather interesting. Namely, well, if now these pairs of x comma lambda being critical points, lambda is any real number. So a priori lambda could be positive, negative or zero. So if lambda is positive, then we can just rescale x in time. And then we just have a, have a, a periodic orbit of our Hamiltonian system of given energy zero and of period lambda. That's the things we were interested in, we were looking for. But, but this Rabino section functional gives us more solutions that we were not asking for. Uh, namely, there's also solutions with negative lambda, which uh, you can interpret as uh, Hamiltonian orbits, but then run backwards. So they have negative period. And now lambda could also be zero. If it's zero, then the first equation tells you x dot is equal to zero. So x is just constant. And wherever that constant lives, where well, it must live on the level set, sigma, where h is equal to zero, but any point there gives you a constant solution, which is also a critical point. Yes, so all the constants on sigma are also solutions. Okay, so, so this phenomenon that all of a sudden you find solutions with, with negative uh, lambda or solutions run backwards might remind some of you of something you've seen in physics. At least it reminded me. Uh, anybody a suggestion? No physicists in the audience. All right. Um, so, so when Dirac uh, tried to turn the Klein-Gordon equation into a first order equation uh, to describe quantum mechanics, uh, um, then uh, he basically took the square root of the Klein-Gordon equation and he, he found solutions that he was looking for solving the first order equation, which became known as the Dirac equation. But then he also find another set of solutions which have negative energy or which could be interpreted as solutions where time is running backwards. And uh, one of Dirac's great achievements, I think, is not to immediately discard those solutions as mathematical artifacts, but uh, rather take them serious and uh, this way to predict the existence of antiparticles. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't think this has anything to do with it, but I think it's a good story. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now we have a nice action functional. And uh, in view of what I, uh, what I told you before, what I want to do now is I want to take Morse homology of that action function in order to find critical points and maybe even find the number of critical points, right? Now, this is living on a vastly infinite dimensional space, this loop space. So uh, it's not so clear how to actually do Morse theory there. And uh, there is various ways of doing it. And the correct way of doing it was taught to us by Fleur in the late 80s. And uh, he, he explained how to, how to make sense of infinite dimensional Morse theory of such functionals, uh, which became known under the name Fleur homology. I will not go into the uh, precise definition, but then when, when Urs Faunfeld and I saw that functional, we immediately realized, yeah, I think this should all go through and work fine. So we should be able to define uh, uh, Fleur homology of that one, which will then be called Rabinowitz Fleur homology of that functional and should also have those the following properties which follow rather easily from, from that functional. So let me just go through them. First of all, it should be well-defined, should also be independent of the actual Hamiltonian, only depend on its zero level set on the sigma. So if you have two different Hamiltonians defining the same hypersurface should have the same uh, homology. Then it should be invariant under deformations of your hypersurface. If you have a smooth uh, family of embedded hypersurfaces, it shouldn't change. That's the second property. The third property, if you, can re if you can displace one hypersurface completely from itself by a Hamiltonian isotopy, a time one map of a Hamiltonian system, not the one with H, some other one, uh, then it should vanish. And finally, if your hypersurface sigma does not carry any periodic orbits, any non-constant periodic orbits, then the hom Rabinowitz homology should just be the homology of the hypersurface itself because that means from the critical points, you don't have any critical points with positive or negative lambda. You only have those with lambda equal to zero, which corresponds to points on sigma. You perturb them slightly by Morse function on sigma and you compute, you get the 
singular homology of sigma, right? Okay, so, so when we saw all those properties, uh, um, we got all excited uh, because you see just, and some of those properties work against each other and uh, you can immediately draw some conclusions. For instance, suppose the hypersurface sigma sits in CN. <laughs> now in CN, I, I forgot to write the hypersurface should be compact always. Yeah, but it could be in CN. So, the, so CN, in CN, a translation is a Hamiltonian flow. So you can always displace that hypersurface from itself by translation, just move far enough. That's the Hamiltonian flow. So it's displaceable. So it's Rabinowitz phenomenology should be zero. All right. But if, it, if this hypersurface had no periodic orbits, then it's Rabinowitz flow homology would be its singular homology, which is non-zero, right? Because it's a closed compact hypersurface. So, uh, so it means every hypersurface in CN uh, has to have a periodic orbit. Now at that point, we got slightly worried because uh, uh, in 1995, Victor Ginsburg proved for us that there exist hypersurfaces in CN which do not have any periodic orbits, compact hypersurfaces in CN which don't carry any periodic orbits. Yeah. Uh, so, so something must have been wrong. And uh, we were puzzled for a while because we thought we had learned of the homology and it seems that everything should just go through very nicely and smoothly. And uh, the solution to it was really that uh, what goes wrong is precisely that we have this additional Lagrange multiplier and which can vary in R and R is non-compact as I learned the hard way. Yeah? So, so, uh, and, uh, and it is possible that somehow uh, in doing the argument, for example, that the boundary operator squares to zero, you need some kind of compactness and this might go, go wrong because of the Lagrange multiplier escaping to plus or minus infinity in R. So that, because that was a new phenomenon which had not been present in Fleur's theory before. Nobody had considered Fleur homology of such a Lagrange multiplier function. So there was something that we could not build on other people's work as we usually like doing. Yeah? And uh, so, so then, then we actually had to uh, sit down and work and try to prove that the Lagrange multiplier is also not escaping to infinity. And so it turned out we could only do that under some additional geometric condition on that hypersurface. And, uh, and the conditions under which we could do it turned out to be precisely the conditions under which other people before us had proved existence of periodic orbits. Yeah? So, so uh, uh, the simplest condition which we first uh, figured out where it works is if it's of exact contact type, um, whatever it means, it's written there. And the uh, slightly more general condition would be if it's stable and tame. I will not define it. But in, so in those, both of these cases, we get existence of periodic orbits, which unfortunately was known before that. Nevertheless, still, this is still a useful result because you can, you can play with these four properties in different ways yet. So, so there's a whole list of applications. Uh, let me just mention one. For instance, suppose again, sigma is in Cn. So it's displaceable, so it's a real thermology is zero. Um, but suppose that for this sigma abstract, so sigma is there and it's of contact type, it's of restricted contact type. So it gets some context structure. Now suppose conversely, we start with some contact manifold, manifold with the context structure, and somehow we manage to compute this Rabinowitz fleur homology independent of any embedding into C and just, just we manage to compute it. And we show it's non-zero. It means that this cannot be embedded into Cn such that in CN, the induced context structure is the one we started with. So this gives you obstructions to uh, contact embeddings of contact manifolds into, into CN. And this actually can be done if you take the unit cotangent bundle of a simply connected manifold, for example, this way you can show it cannot be embedded into CN in a contact manner. And that generalizes a result of Gromov, which, which tells you that there's no simply connected closed Lagrangians in CN. Yeah, so, so this actually does have uh, quite a number of nice applications in symplectic geometry. Take a breath. Any questions at this point? You, you're the live audience, so you can ask questions. Yeah, the, the people on Zoom cannot. So, uh, well, now comes the third part of my talk. So we'll move to something entirely different and I'll tell you how it relates. Uh, so Poincaré duality, by the way, already came up in a couple of talks, for example, in the talk by uh, Juni Ho 
uh, yesterday, Poincaré duality also appeared, although he was looking at a much more refined structure where you are not only Poincaré duality, but also hard left shift duality. So, it's, so here we'll just focus on Poincaré duality. And in differential geometry, we know that every closed manifold, say orientable, has Poincaré duality. And, uh, but no such thing was known for loop spaces, and I'll make a suggestion of what could be a replacement for loop spaces. But I'll start with something uh, uh, different, namely uh, string topology. What is string topology? It's uh, the study of algebraic structures on the homology of free loop spaces. So here, um, M will be a closed connected oriented manifold of dimension N, and lambda will denote its free loop space, loops of period one. And uh, um, so maybe brief recap, uh, in the case of a based loop space where you take loops at a base point, so you fix a base point in your manifold and you take loops starting and ending at the base point, then uh, algebraic structures on its homology were very well understood. And that goes back to the 50s, I think, work of Heinz Hopf and others, Ponteriagin, and uh, this this base loop space is an H space and therefore its homology is a Hopf algebra and that imposes very strong restrictions on its homology. So that's a very old story, which is very well understood. Now, in case of the free loop space, nothing much was known until 1999, when in, in, in a marvelous paper, Chasson Sullivan wrote down a whole bunch of operations on the homology of loop spaces and in, in many variations. Uh, so uh, you can do as one equivariant and non-equivariant. So I will talk about the non-equivariant loop space homology, just ordinary homology of loop space. And there, in, on that homology, uh, Chas and Sullivan described two operations which we will interest. One is the loop product, mu. So it's a product on the homology of loop spaces. How do you think about that? So you take two homology classes in loop spaces, A and B, and you represent them by some cycles, singular cycles in loop space. So we, we, we're given two chains of loops. So chains of loops, you think of, uh, well, I'm thinking of them as, as loops moving in the manifold, some family of moves, loops moving in the manifold. You take another one, another family of loops moving continuously in the manifold. Now all those loops are parameterized. So we, we have an evaluation at time zero, likewise here, and then, for some values of the, of the parameters on your domain, it might happen that the evaluation of times, at time zero of the two loops coincide. If we have two loops whose evaluation at time zero coincide, it means the two loops intersect there, and we can, we can make one loop out of two. We can run through the first one and then the second one at double speed. And uh, that way we get a product, yeah? So that's what's uh, drawn schematically on the left-hand side. A and B are two cycles in loop space. And then whenever we have uh, incidents at time zero, then we, we concatenate. So that's the picture description definition of the loop product, mu of AB. And that's an operation of degree minus N because we imposed a, a co-dimension N condition that the evaluation at time zero in the manifold M coincide. You can do very much the same construction dually, you can define a co-product on the loop space homology. Namely, you take uh, just one chain of loops and you take evaluation at time zero and at some other time t, which is allowed to vary freely. It's not fixed, it's allowed to vary. And then you ask when those two coincide, which means that your loops have self-intersections. And then when, you, when they self-intersect, then you can decompose that loop and view it as two loops. First you go from zero to t and then from t to one, and both are loops. Yeah? And that way you get a co-product and uh, that has degree one minus N because we have this additional free parameter T there. All right, that's, let, let me call this the loop co-product. And that's the co-product on homology. So it's, it's dual to a product on cohomology. That product has been studied extensively by Goreski and Hingston. So it also became known as the goreski hingston uh, product, uh, although I'm forbidden to use that name uh, because Nancy <laughs> Hingston doesn't want us to write, to call it Goreski Hingston product in our paper. All right. So let me, let me mention one subtlety here though, namely that the loop co-product is not defined on the homology of lambda, but it's only defined on the homology of lambda mod relative to the constant loops. Why is that? Because to, 
to make this well defined, you need some kind of transversality. Uh, uh, you need the evaluation at time zero and at time t to be transverse. Now, if t itself is equal to zero, then you are in trouble because then it's never transverse. Uh, it's just no way. And uh, so one way to get around that is, okay, well, yeah, okay, never mind. But if at time zero, well, it, we decompose it into some loop, which is the original one and the constant loop. So let's just mod out the constant loops and then we just got rid of that difficulty. And then it's indeed, you can show that relative to the constant loops, it's well defined. Yeah, so, so that's why the lambda is only on the relative homology relative to lambda zero, the space of constant loops. Okay, now in relation to this uh, product and co-product, uh, some puzzles arose and I will just mention two of them. We have a much longer list in our paper. Um, one is the following, uh, we have a nice product and a co-product. So uh, thinking of base loop space where we have a Hodge algebra, uh, a Hop Hopf algebra structure, ah, it's your fault. Okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where we have a Hopf uh, algebra structure, uh, which also involves the product and the co-product satisfying certain algebraic relations. It looks like on the free loop space, we also want to have a nice bi-algebra structure involving a product and a co-product satisfying certain algebraic relations. Well, yeah, but uh, uh, they're not living on the same space even, right? One is living on homology of lambda, the other one relative to the constant loops. So first question, can we put them somewhere on the same space? Okay, and, and this question is not so obvious because uh, our first attempt was, well, okay, let's try to work a bit harder and try to attempt and define lambda just on the whole loop space, not modding out the constant, it doesn't quite work. And then we thought, well, we go the opposite. We descend the product from the homology of lambda to the homology of lambda relative to the constant loops doesn't work. Yeah, there's some examples showing it can't work. So uh, it's not completely clear how to do that, but it can be done. So assuming we can do that, and we will uh, show you how, uh, then question what algebraic relations do they satisfy? Then we have two operations on the same space. They should satisfy some nice algebra, right? I mean, it's coming from geometry. So the algebra has got to be nice. And, uh, and Sullivan uh, gave us a suggestion of one relation uh, that should maybe be part of that algebra uh, between the product and the co-product. Uh, I mean, I don't know, he optimistically wrote on this relation, although they were never defined on the same space even, but in some, well, this is Dennis Sullivan. I think he, he can get away with that. Um, and uh, it's the following relation. I, don't look at the formula. I, I, I can't do algebra. I can only draw pictures. So, so my picture representation of mu is a pair of pens, uh, like from from top to bottom, and the uh, and the coproduct is an inverted pair of pens after it's getting wet, like this morning, and you hang it for drying. Yeah? And then uh, you uh, and that's the relation. Okay. So it's uh, this was quite a mysterious relation. This really mystified us for a long time because uh, well, we're used to seeing structures like Frobenius algebras, topological quantum field theories, and this is none of them. Huh? Okay, I'll come back to that. And, uh, and we, we called it Sullivan's relation because we talked about it so much uh, that we need to give it a name. We called it Sullivan's relation. I'm not sure he would approve, in particular because it will turn out to be wrong. All right. Um, so the so second puzzle uh, goes back to, uh, to Nancy Hingston. And uh, over the years, I mean, Nancy Hingston is working in uh, geodesic flows, closed geodesic loop spaces. And uh, over the years, she has collected lots of pairs of dual results, one involving the loop product on homology, the other one involving their product on cohomology. And she proved with different methods, a result for the loop product, a result for the, for the cohomology product which look very similar. And I gave you one sample of that. If you take a homology class, capital X on loop space, you can define its critical value. Namely, the loop space comes with a filtration by length of loops. And let me call lambda less than A, the, loop, the subspace of loops of length less than A. Right? And then you can ask, what is the, uh, the smallest A, the smallest value of A, such that a homology class is represented on the loops of length less than A? What's the infimum of that one? And that is, that is the, a, a critical value. And, and you can do a similar thing for a cohomology class. There you ask, what is the largest value of A such that this cohomology class lives in cohomology of lambda relative to lambda less than A? 
Okay, both of them are nice well-defined quantities. And then together with Gorhesky, uh, Nancy Hingston proved uh, that they satisfy some kind of triangle inequality with respect to the product. So with respect to the loop product, the critical value of X times Y for the loop product is less or equal to the sum of the critical values. And for the cohomology product, there's also an equality, but it's going the other way. Right? This is not a typo. I mean, there's some typos on the slides, but there's not one of them. Uh, so the critical value of two cohomology classes is greater equal to the sum of the critical values. Yeah? So, I mean, this clearly wants to be the same statement, but it clearly isn't. And uh, yeah, so, so, so Nancy asked, and, and she has a, a list of, I think, six or seven other such, uh, such dual pairs of results, which which clearly want to be the same statement uh, under some kind of duality. She was asking, is there some kind of something she called Poincare duality uh, for a loop phase, which would explain that these two results are really the same result and, uh, and one would imply the other under this duality, yeah? Okay, now, now in, at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, they have this wonderful, uh, this wonderful mathematical conversations, uh, which happen in a relaxed atmosphere with wine and cheese, and and uh, people have uh, I'm not sure ten minutes, I think, really, I think ten minutes to to explain to a general mathematical audience some mystifying question in their field in their own research. And Nancy Hinkson in 2017 gave a talk in this mathematical conversations at at the IAS, and and uh, Alexandro Wancha, who was working uh, together with me on Rabinowitz homology, happened to be in the audience. So after the talk, he ran back to his room. He he uh, wrote down his notes. He scanned them. He sent them to me, and uh, and uh, literally within I think two days, uh, we had resolved all these puzzles that Nancy Hinkson had had uh, collected, uh, we had understood that all of them get, get resolved in terms of Rabinowitz through homology. Um, now, it took us another five years to write everything down, but now it's done, and uh, so I'll present uh, the outcome. But I think it was complete, it's, yeah, uh, you may see it's, it's completely obvious that these things are all related by some kind of duality. So how does it work? So we introduce a new group into, into loop space homology. So we have already the loop space homology, we have the loop space cohomology, and we form another group and we do the following. We take the cotangent bundle of the manifold M that is a nice Liouville domain, nice exact symplectic manifold. And inside we have the cotangent vectors of, of length one with respect to some metric, doesn't really matter. Uh, that is a nice contact hypersurface. And we can take its Rabinowitz flow homology. So I call that S star sigma and we take its Rabinowitz flow homology. Okay, so, so let's just define that thing. Uh, and we call this the Rabinowitz loop homology. Okay. And let's see some of its properties. So in fact, something that we had known a long time back already in work with, uh, with Frauenfeld and Alexander Wanscha is that this Rabinowitz loop homology fits into a nice long exact sequence with loop space homology and loop space cohomology. So, so if you just look at the horizontal sequence, that is a sequence which involves loop space homology, this extended one, this Rabinowitz loop homology and loop space cohomology. And in fact, this map epsilon is, is almost zero, in some cases actually zero. So, so really some of this almost wants to be the direct sum of loop space homology and loop space cohomology. And that's maybe how you want to think of it. But uh, there's a more precise way. It's also related to homology and cohomology real constants. And now you see, if you look at the two embeddings, well, not quite embeddings, but maps, iota and i. So one is sending the, the loop space homology into this uh, Rabinowitz version, and the other one sending the loop space cohomology relative constants into Rabinowitz homology. Now on both of those, we have the two products, the loop product and the loop co -pro uh, the cohomology product. And the question is, can we put a product on Rabinowitz Fleur which would then somehow generalize both of them, include both of those. Uh, in fact, yes, and that's the product we've known for a long time. There's a, on any kind of Fleur, Fleur homology in symplectic geometry, there's a natural pair of pants product. That, so, so that's a product that had been well known for a long time. So, so here's the first result. Now from this point on, Nancy Higgs will be co-author of all those results because she really initiated this whole, part, whole chain of results. Um, so there exists a product mu and a co-product lambda on Rabinowitz loop homology in the center. 
which is uh, related to the other one. So, so think, look at the blue part of the, of the picture. Blue is about products and red is about co-products, which is completely dual. So let's look at the products. So in the middle, we have this product new on Rubino, it's loop homology. And, it, it, uh, is, uh, and the map going from loop homology with the loop product is a, is a ring homomorphism. So that intertwines the product. So this is an extension of the loop product. It's also an extension of the product of cohomology via this other map i there yeah and and the image of iota and of i go on to complementary subspaces so basically this product on Rabinus homology contains as components both the loop product and the cohomology product yeah likewise the co-product there's also co-product on Rabinus loop homology which is extending the loop co-product and it's and the dual of the loop product all right so we achieved part of what we wanted to, namely we extended the, the loop product and the cohomology product and, and, and lambda also to some common space, Rabino is loop homology. There we have both operations defined. And the question is what algebraic structure is there? To describe that, let's degree shift by N as is common in string topology. So that puts the product into, which had degree minus N, it, it puts it into degree zero. It's just more pleasant algebraically. And the copro then uh, attains degree one minus two n. And then uh, Rabinowitz loop homology becomes a commutative, co commutative graded Frobenius algebra. Now, that's something we proved only very recently because basically we were blocked by Sullivan's relation. Because Sullivan's relation is not a relation in a graded Frobenius algebra. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were always looking for some different algebraic structure. And, and uh, it took us a while to overcome this obstacle and realize that it is really an, a structure which we've known all along, well, except for the word graded. So usually a Frobenius algebra is equivalent to a two-dimensional TQFT. And uh, so you can think of it as just uh, being morphisms associated to cobordisms, uh, to two-dimensional cobordisms. Now in the graded setting, you can't quite think about it that way, but you can still write down the, all the same relations just with, with appropriate signs. Uh, because in our case, the Product and copro have, have opposite parity, where usually for Frobenius algebra they have the same parity. Yeah. That's, but that's the only difference. Uh, so here's a definition. Let me not dwell on that. Uh, let me just emphasize. So, so the main new, so it's it, a graded Frobenius algebra involves a product and a co product. The product should have a unit, the co product should have a co unit. Here's pictures of that. So, so the epsilon is the co unit. And now if you attach the co-unit to the out output of the product, you get a pairing. And that pairing is a perfect pairing. So that induces an isomorphism basis between that space and its dual. And likewise, you get a co-pairing, which will also ind induce an isomorphism. And there's more relations. There's TQFT type relations, which I'm not drawing all of them. And uh, now, now it's getting even better. Now Poincare duality also comes naturally. Um, namely, this structure of a graded Frobenius algebra is self-dual. If A is a graded Frobenius algebra, then A dual will also be. And, uh, and it turns out that the structure on A and A dual are in fact isomorphic by a canonical isomorphism from A to A dual. And this isomorphism is, if you look at the very bottom at part three, in terms of the Frobenius algebra structure, it just comes as part of that structure, namely it's just induced by that pairing or it's induced by the co-pairing, which gives you the inverse of it. It's just coming as part of the algebraic structure. Now, in fact, before seeing that, we had already uh, seen, Rabin, seen this concrete duality in a number of different ways. And in fact, going all the way back to the original definition of Rubino's uh, homology with Lagrange multipliers, I had mentioned that there's a particular duality, namely, if you have a solution, an orbit, a pair x comma lambda, where x is an orbit and lambda Lagrange multiplier, then the pair x bar comma minus lambda where x bar is just x running backwards is also a critical point. And that, that involution on critical points in fact gives you an involution, uh, gives you a, a, an isomorphism between homology and cohomology, between Rabinowitz fleur homology and Rabinowitz fleur cohomology. This is just, just a very general fact. So this, this very nice symmetry actually is Poincare duality. Yeah. Uh, so it's coming to us in a, in a variety of different manners. So there's a, we have uh, at least three different proofs of Poincare duality. And now the way the puzzles are resolved is that uh, 
can I see? Yeah, that uh, the first one I already resolved. Yeah, we have extended them on the same space. They satisfy a nice algebraic structure, graded for Venus algebra structure. Now, Sullivan's relation is not part of that structure. What is part of that structure? Pardon, is Sullivan's relation with an additional term which I drew in red. So it's it's true, but with an uh, with an additional term. It's exactly this additional term which is responsible for Poincaré duality. Puzzle two is resolved for each of those pairs of dual results, we can show that they're really the same result under Poincare duality. And uh, this is uh, my last slide. Uh, the clock is down to eight, seven, six. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kai. Uh, let's, let's thank Kai for, uh, and thank you the audience for listening to this talk. <laughs>